the good stuff. You know, there's not too many other sportsmen that have experienced some of the good stuff that I have, and also the bad stuff. Warren bypassed everything bar the stumps. Ah! And he's bowling behind his pads. But the words that followed were not worthy of Warren's deed. Hudson and the umpire were unimpressed. The finger pointing from England's David Shepherd passed on via border. Now look, I think uh, we better just cool it a little bit. I hadn't bowled for overs. I, was, I think it was like 40 or 50 overs and we couldn't take any wickets. And so Alan Border said, next over that end, and come on, we need a wicket. And I said, well, mate, why didn't you bowl me earlier if we needed a wicket? So I was fired up. And I just, for some reason, snap. I just snapped after all that building, and I was just a release. Andrew Hudson's one of the nicest guys you've ever met. Had absolutely nothing to do with it. And um, anyway, so I told him where to go and followed him off. And it was just looking back now, I could see how angry I was in my face. I was angry. But after that day's play, we go back to the dressing room, have a beer with him. They're all laughing about it. And I sat next to Andrew Hudson. He was, he said, mate, it's cool. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Then Cricket Australia stand up. There's reporters back there in Australia saying, we're embarrassed to be Australian after Shane Warne the way he carried on. And I'm thinking, what the hell? This is a bit over the top. I was getting a bit fed up with everything. I, I felt expectations and everything that was going on was just too much. And um, you know, as soon as we had a day off, I was shooting a commercial, I was doing all sorts of stuff, I had no me time. At that stage, you're probably trying to please everyone too, you know, you're just trying to not say no. And um, you know, that's where I, I could have been better at things looking back. The newspaper headlines that blew the lid off one of Australia's biggest cricket scandals. During the course of the 1994 tour of Sri Lanka, before we went to Pakistan, I was approached by a man who I later, dis later discovered to be a bookmaker from India. Look, that's such a long story about that stuff. The, the John Bookmaker, I never knew was a bookmaker for starters. It was a friend of Mark Wars. Mark had a business deal with John. I, this guy, I lost five grand in a casino. He gave me five grand, I lost at a casino. Spoke to him 12 months later on a phone just to say, Merry Christmas, do you think you're gonna win? Yep. Not knowing he was a bookmaker, he was a friend of Junior's. And in the end, um, when I got told, do you know a guy called John? I said, yeah, he's a mate of June's. Well, he's a bookmaker. I said, what? I didn't know that stage. So. Yeah, look, there's a few things that you would do differently and then I was disappointed with the way it all turned out. I don't hold any grudges against Mark. I'm my own boss. I've got to be responsible for my own actions and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, yeah, look, it's, there are some of those things that I've experienced. So that's why I suppose I'm a good person to talk to about the ups and downs of being a sportsman and how important it is to have good people around you. Australia retain the ashes, they win this test match series. The English were singing to me all day, six hours, and we'd finally won the ashes after. I was copping a pasting. Outside the Trent Bridge, a lot of the crowd all uh, amalgamated, like just outside your dressing room. So we had a lot of Aussies there, a lot of English there, and we're all having a few drinks, and they started still ripping into me and singing those songs. And I was sort of like, no, 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 we've got the ashes, blah, blah, blah. So I just did this stupid dance with the stump. And um, that was just to all the English fans out there just saying, you know, suck it, we've got the ashes, basically. That's what it was. You just want to thump him. <laughs> you just want to flip it, work him over. You know, he's this lad with a bit of weight on, doesn't do any training. He's just bamboozled us again. He's dancing with a stump. He's danced with far better things than stumps, I could tell you. But you copped a fair bit for that, didn't you? In the yeah, press, I, I, at home as well. Yeah, well, okay, what, what do I, I dance with a stump above my head saying, unlucky, your palms, we've we got the ashes. What, is that all right or? No, nah, I copped it, so, but anyway, who cares? An ashes series needs characters and Shane provided. It can be a long time fielding against Australia when Adam Gilchrist is coming in at seven and you got Ponting, etc. ahead of him. And in the field, listening to the Barmy Army with their Shane Warne songs that they had and Warney reacting to it. He'll be sort of goading him and waving his arm and doffing his cap and all that sort of stuff. If you do that though, if you behave like that, you better follow up. If you talk the talk, you better walk the walk. And that is something that Warren definitely did. 1998, you had a shoulder up and you were told you might never play again. How did you feel? Yeah, that was quite tough. Uh, 98, uh, went in for basically what they call a slap lesion, which is what javelin throwers have. Uh, and they basically rebuild your whole shoulder. So they, you know, they bicep tendons. I got four screws in my shoulder. Uh, yeah, it was a quite a, to say that, um, 
you know, you might never play, might never play again because leg spin bowling, you internally rotate without trying to get too scientific about things. It's not a natural, actually, you know, we move our arm over like that. We do that all day. But to, to do that with your shoulder, you know, with force and repetition is difficult. And, uh, you know, I was very, very lucky. Did a couple of finger operations, but four, four in the end I ended up having uh, on my shoulder. And this one was the biggest one where they had to rebuild the whole thing. It just took a bit of time for me to get strong again in it and also to trust it and to have the confidence in it to get up there and give it a rip because it felt completely different. A couple of tough decisions as far as uh, the final makeup of the side. Yeah, Shane Warren's missed out. And it's, it's obviously hard when a great player misses out. Uh, Greg Lloyd also comes in the side, and with Colin Miller and Adam Dale. So we've got a couple of changes, but uh, we believe it's a pretty well balanced lineup. I guess the big news is around the world in cricket circles, not last week's result now, is the news that Shane Warren has been left out of an Australian cricket team. Alan, it would be a pretty tough decision. Well, it's the hardest decision I've been involved with, David. Uh, almost felt sick sort of walking out of that. Uh, selection meeting, uh, knowing you've, you've dropped an absolute legend of the game and a, a, a spinner that's got over 300 test wickets and it's just a rare occurrence. I remember sitting there, Jeff Marsh was the coach, Steve Wall was captain, myself I was vice captain and at that stage then it's still the captain, vice captain picked the team with the coach. You'd all sit around and say, okay, what's our team? And Steve Wall said, mate, I don't think you can, I don't think you should play this next test match. I think we should play McGillar, you're not bowling very well and it's a crucial test match this one. Uh, we need to win it. And I was like, oof, geez, that's a bit uh, harsh, Tug. I, I said, I don't think I've ever let Australia down in any stage, and I think the situation of this test match will bring out the best of me. Hopefully that'll make me bowl pretty well. And I felt a bit of a scapegoat because we hadn't played that well in the first few test matches. So in the end, Steve Wall said, no, nah, Shane's not playing. We're going to go with Stewie McGill, and, um, and no, you're not playing this test match. And for Steve Wall not to back me then in that situation was... Um, you know, really disappointing. Last four. And they're running away with this match at the moment, New Zealand. Going into the 1999 World Cup then, here in England, mm -hmm. what was your mindset given that, what happened in the West Indies? Yeah, I struggled for a bit of form. I was a bit like uh, just searching for that form, searching for that feel. You can be as positive as you want in your head and you can be aggressive as you want in your mind, but you still got to be able to back it up. And I wasn't really backing up with my, my um, bowling. We were playing poorly. We lost a few games early. Um, Steve Ward put a curfew on us, which was, you know, we couldn't have a drink. Everyone was starting to get a bit... In the end, we all said, guys, we've got to drop this curfew. And I've really, once we dropped the curfew, we started playing better. Welcome to Edgbaston for this second semi-final. It's Australia versus South Africa. The match that decides who goes to meet Pakistan in the final of World Cup 99 at Lords on Sunday. The semi-final of the World Cup against South Africa was the time where I thought, this is it. Don't stop holding back with your shoulders. Stop. If it falls off, who cares? And the situation of the game again brought out the best in me. I came on the bowl and we needed a wicket. We just had to get a wicket and then I bowled a ball to Herschel Gibbs that was a, a pretty good delivery, actually. Ah! Oh, beautiful ball. That's a wonderful delivery from Shane Warne. Clipping the top of off stump. That's absolutely exactly what the Australians needed. For me, that was a game that, that, that sort of helped me for the rest of my career, that game, because I knew that I could still do it. And those doubts, those little doubts I had beforehand that not in my head, but just being able to execute it and do it on the field. I wasn't doing it for the first time in my life. And that was frustrating. And in the end, I started to do it again. And from then on, it was OK. Ah! Hold him out. Warns fired up all right. Pakistan struggling now. They're 77 for four. And that'll do. Australia are winners of the 1999 World Cup. You saved your best for last, the last two performances, man of the match jobs. Uh, that must be pleasing. Yeah, well, I thought I'd been bowling pretty well throughout the whole tournament, a uh, couple of off days, but I think it's just the nature of the game. And uh, the last couple of games, I think the ball's come out pretty well, and uh, I suppose there must be something in it. Uh, a couple of big games sort of brought out the best in me, and, um, yeah, it was something we'll always remember. 
The Australian cricket board asked Shane Warne to explain his actions before stripping him of the vice-captaincy. The married father of two admitted making lewd phone calls to a nurse in England. I think I've given the best I possibly can at uh, a lot of time, every single time I've played cricket for Australia, but um, I'll cop it on the chin and get on with playing cricket for Australia, as I, as I said before. So instead, wicketkeeper Adam Gilchrist takes on the role as vice-captain from his good friend. Hopefully that won't impinge on the, uh, the friendship, and I'm sure it won't, and certainly not from my point of view, and, and I really wouldn't expect it to from, from Warney, but um, he, there's no doubt he'll be disappointed with the decision. The way I lost the vice-captaincy was... It sort of did hurt a little bit, because... I mean, Adam Gilchrist took over as vice-captain. He was only basically in this side for a year or so. They were still learning uh, test cricket. He suddenly was the golden boy. He was the, um, you know, he was the face of all the sponsors of Australian cricket. He was vice-captain. Um, so that was a, a, sort of those circumstances a bit disappointing straight away after I thought I'd done pretty well for 10 years. We'd just won a World Cup. Uh, I was vice-captain of the World Cup under Steve Waugh. And we'd, you know, pulled off a miraculous victory there and um, I thought I was a good support and help to Steve Waugh. Unfortunately, you know, some of the off-field things, I don't think it had anything to do with my cricket stuff. There was too many off-field things, which, which is right, fair enough from Cricket Australia, but I'm not sure Adam Gilchrist was the right, right candidate at that stage. I was uh, shocked and absolutely devastated to be informed by ASDA yesterday that a test sample which was collected in Australia on the 22nd of January indicated the presence of a prohibited substance. I'm shocked because I do not take performance enhancing drugs and never have and do not condone them in any way, shape or form. Now just to put on the record again, you know, I, I, I took a fat pill. Now I wanted to lose weight. That, that's what it was. It wasn't anything else and, you know, I, I hear so many things about different sporting codes, guys on cocaine and doing all these sorts of things and getting swept under the carpet. I take a fat pill to lose a chin or two <laughs> and get rubbed out for a year. The phone rang. They said, you've tested for this diuretic thing. I said, I don't, I don't do drugs, never have in my life, never been curious about it, never, no interest. I hung the phone up, rang Errol Alcott, our physio, and said, mate, I just had this call from Asda saying, I've tested positive for drugs. You know what I'm like with the drugs. I don't do it and I hate people that do it. And he said, well, let's go through all your toilet bag and all that sort of stuff. I said, yeah, let's go through every single tablet and Voltaren and anti-inflammatory and painkiller and all that stuff. I said, go through it. So we emptied it all out and we looked at it. He said, no, it's none of this stuff. I said, well, mate, I, have I taken a headache tablet or something that I have? And then we started thinking. I said, oh, Mum gave me a fat pill. So I rang my mum to find out what it was. Then Errol rang them and then found it and said, that's it. And I was like, oh, you've got to be kidding. You, you've got to be. This is not, this is not real. So anyway, I, um, Cricket Australia got in touch and said, you're going to have to go back home. We're sending you home. And I said, oh, you, mate, this, this is not real. Um, so then I addressed the team, I broke down in front of the team and said, guys, you know what I'm like with this stuff and I'm so sorry to let you down, I, I feel like I've let you down, I, I, I wasn't trying to cheat the system, I'm, not a, I'm just not that type of guy, you all know that. I remember being told about it and I thought, right, there's only one way I can handle this, I've got to get all the boys together, I've got to get the whole group together, we've got to sit down, we've got to hear Warney's side of the story and let him talk through what, what's taken place and what's happened and then we need to sit there and talk it through and make sure that by the time we left that room and that meeting that it wasn't going to be spoken about again. You know, and in the end, I got sent back home and faced this thing and went through the hearing. Um, they ridiculed my mum, which I was really Cricket Australia in the hearing. You know, my mum left school at 13. She didn't really understand how all that sort of system works. She just answered the questions honestly, not telling her to speak up, but we can't hear you. And, and I was getting rope all that time. So I sat there and at the end, when they all stood up, I said, you can get stuffed. And, and that was it. And, I got rubbed out for a year. I think where it really affected him when he had photographers jump in the fence and taking pictures of his kids at school. Um, that, or, or he couldn't basically walk his kids to school, which, he, which they lived 100 metres away. So um, I think the invasion of privacy was, was... That got to him the most, about more so his kids. Um, and his mum and dad, particularly his mum, um, went through a tough patch there. Yeah. It was, just a, it was just one of those really tough times. Tough time on my kids, tough time on a stage my wife, and my parents, my brother, everyone, all our family. It was just really tough. Shane warns back and can't wait for test action. 
He served his one-year ban for taking a banned drug and goes straight into Australia's squad for next month's series in Sri Lanka. I'm just happy to be back in the side. Um, with things that have happened over the last 12 months, uh, I think it would have been pretty easy to, to throw in a lot of things. But uh, at the moment, I've worked pretty hard, uh, both physically and uh, from a bowling point of view. Wonderful bowling from Chain Warm. What a cricketer this man is. I think just a bit of a kick in the backside or a setback like that in his career was something that would always spur him on or push him on, you know. If he had a problem in his personal life, he had, a, he had the ability to be able to put that aside and come out and play an un unbelievable game, you know, a couple of days later. He bounced back from massive accusations and, um, you know, he came back out and the consistency, consistency was there. He'd had a few injuries, operations, and there was a, you know, a big slant on him as a person after the allegation, so... Yeah, he soldiered on and he was the great bowler as always. Every single time you go to the MCG or you pass the MCG, you have the odd flashback or the odd memory of what it was like playing there. You know, there's a lot of grounds in Australia, like Adelaide Oval, are picturesque and all that stuff, but the MCG is pretty special. It's a, it's a coliseum. Australia on top here, South Africa straight on three for 51, 10 overs to go, we're halfway. Moises giving him a bit of a rip. Playing and commentating with Warney is not dissimilar. He always does something a bit different, and that's what I really loved about playing cricket with him and commentating with him, because you're never really sure what you're going to get, but it, hang on to your hats, it'll be, probably be pretty exciting. Start here from Cummins too, you can see yeah. the pace. So you've been his teammate on the field, you know, his teammate off the field with Channel 9. How's that working out? The same. It, it just feels seamless. It's the same, you know. Pull him into line every couple of days, you know. But, but, and he'll, he'll push a point hard. He'll certainly... Uh, total honesty on what he's feeling, he'll say. Um, so, no, no, nothing's... Absolutely nothing's different. There's, there's energy and there's drama in the com box now. Oh. Got him! You'll be okay. <laughs> One for the leg spinner. Well flighted. Beat him in pace and spun it off the deck too. Well done, Cameron Boyce. I don't like to sit on the fence. I, I, I'm not, you know, maybe I needed to be through my whole career, maybe I need to be a little bit more politically correct. But, um, you know, I, I don't expect everyone to agree with what I say, but I think I'd like to think that they respect me for having an opinion, whether it's they agree with me or not. Um, you know, I don't sit up here to criticise people for the sake of criticising. I, I only commentate on what I see. In the same way that he was as a cricketer, I find him very straightforward. He, uh, despite the fact that he's, you know, one of the greatest cricketers ever to have played the game, there's no uh, ego there that's out of control. Um, he speaks in the same way to the runner as he does to Ian Botham, and I think that's a fantastic attribute. He, he never was captain, really of Australia, he might have done it a couple of times. I should think that's a major regret that he was never national captain, but in commentary, he is five, 10 overs ahead of the game. He would have been a great captain of the country. It comes through, you, you can sort of, you only have to listen to a couple of stints and you go, well, I can see why you're a, a fantastic cricketer. And, uh, you know, because tactically he was so sound. Look, I, I captained Australia in one day, as I think I, I think I did a dozen or 13 or 14 games or something like that, maybe 15. Um, I think I lost one game as Australian captain in one day. Um, so, yeah, of course I would have liked to have done it because I thought it brought out the best of me captaincy. How successful he would have been, who knows, probably very successful. But there are other elements to the captaincy which would have tested him as well. Um, and you ne So you never quite know, but in t from everything we've seen as a, as a, as a bowler, as a cricketer, um, I think he'd have been a great captain, yeah. I don't regret not being captain at all. Um, but, you know, I think Alan Border and Mark Taylor were two of the best captains I played under. Alan Border taught me what it was like to play test cricket, what it was like to play for your country. He was tough, uncompromising, ruthless and in your face. Uh, Mark Taylor then took over from Alan Border 
and he was more of a communicator, Tubbs. You know, he was a great guy. We got, we had a fantastic relationship, me and Mark Taylor. We, we get along really well. And he was probably the best captain I played under. Very easy to captain because he loved playing and competing. Uh, he loved bowling, always wanted to have one more over. And he hated losing. So he hated losing. So that's the sort of guy you want playing for you. And when you're looking for someone to get your wicket, you know if you threw the ball to Warney, he would be giving it everything to get that guy out. You move forward to guys like Steve Waugh, you know, it was completely different. I mean, you know, my role changed under Steve Waugh. Suddenly we had Jason Gillespie, Glenn McGrath and Brett Lee bowling thunderbolts. And uh, we went from Mark Taylor and Alan Border, whatever, if we won the toss, we batted first, make as many runs as we can, declare, and then hopefully Shane would bowl them out in the last day, you know, and everyone else would chime in. And that was the way we won test matches. But uh, once Steve Waugh took over, it was different. We bowled first all the time in those three quickies. My role in the team changed. I had to work out how to take wickets on day one and two as a leg spinner, which wasn't easy. So yeah, it was, a, it, it was annoying at times, but I understood it, you know what I mean? It just meant that I had to readjust my mentality, my attitude to it, and say, well, okay, we've got three quickies here doing really good. Why not give it a go? Let's see how it goes. So I was cool with it, but I just, and I totally understood it, and we still won, so there was no issue. So you understood the principle, but one game in particular I'd like to highlight, Edge Baston 05. So yeah. McGrath goes over in a heap, yet you still bowl. Surely that was a time when Ponting could have said, well, hang on. We've still got this yeah. bloke in the side. Well, Ponting Let's was exactly the same as Steve Waugh. He, he would bowl first and all that sort of stuff. And it was actually interesting because when the captains went out to toss, I just put my whites on and everyone was sort of waiting for the toss. And I, I can't remember who it was. They said, what are you doing? I said, well, we're going to be bowling. We're bowling first. I promise you right now, Michael Vaughan's going to win the toss and bat. And they said, well, I don't know about... I said, they'll bat, mate. This is Edge Baston. It turns miles at the end. Oh, we're going to have a bowl this morning, mate, with the uh, overhead conditions the way they are and... Uh... The wicket probably being still a few days behind, even after a couple of days of sun. Uh, hopefully we can do some damage this morning. I think they made 440 day one, something like that. We only bowled 82 overs, I think, in the day, or 83 overs in the day. So, yeah, that was a real... I'm sure that's something, if you ask Ricky, he'll say, yeah, I got that wrong. Oh, it's in the end of sports. What a victory. England have pulled it off. England have won by two runs. But, you know, you can say we only lost by a couple of runs. Maybe if we had batted a bit better, we would have won. So that was, to me, though, when you're 1-0 up, you got on a flat road, we go in and bat at Edge Baston. I reckon the whole 2005 Ashes series could have been different. Now, England could have bowled us out for 100. Who knows? But I just think even if we posted 250, 300 runs on that pitch, it would have been a completely different outcome to the whole Ashes series. Amazing, amazing. This man is incredible. He was doing it not only when he had McGrath at the other end throughout his career, but also, and when Australia were winning, but in that 2005 series, he did it when other people didn't stand up and Warren did stand up to the, to the England side. Chamberlain round the wicket to Flintoff, who's on 73. Ah! Well, that's pretty convincing. I think he was one of those bowlers, like Muralithran, that even though you practised hard and you prepared hard to play against, he could always bowl you a ball that you couldn't prepare for. He'd always produce a bit of magic. And every time Australia were under the pump, you always felt that he was the man, he was the one with McGrath that would always get them back into a match. Oh! Well, he's still got something to say in this series. Six wickets in the first innings, now five in the second. You know, yeah, that series was pretty special and I think everyone that witnessed that series or played in that series will remember it. And England were the better side, they deserved to win that series. England have regained the Ashes. You can say the Edge Baston thing might have been a different outcome, it might have been, but it was a hell of a series. For me personally, you know, I, I was going through a divorce I was missing my kids because I played a Hampshire before the Ashes. We all go through tough times. There are always things that crop up that you didn't plan or you didn't know were coming. And it's how you handle them, it's how you get through it. And it almost seemed at times with Warney, the more there was a bushfire going on over here in his personal life, the better he played. Is that when you really got to know Michael Clark and how much did he help you? Yeah, I mean, Michael was a great influence. 
because he knew how much I was struggling off the field and to, I suppose, for myself to get back on the field and focus in on what we had to do against a rampant England. And then, you know, there was times, you know, he would sit with me and say, right, we're going to drink the mini bar or do we need to go out? Let's get a spag bowl in the room. And, um, you know, he was a, my Dr Phil, I suppose, a lot through that series. And he was trying to make his way in the test side sure. too, you know, so it wasn't easy for him. So I'll never forget that as a, as a friend more than just a colleague of cricket. I remember I had a disagreement with Justin Langer in 2005 in England. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was about, but Lang had a crack at me. I had a crack back at him. I was a young player in the team. Um, there was other players around and, and Warney jumped in and stood up for me. And I was like, yes, you know, <laughs> Warney's got my back. You know, how good's that? It made me feel really special. Got back to the hotel and like Warney and I did, we'd have sit in the room, have room service together. He said, come to the room, we'll, we'll have a pasta. And he probably had fries and pizza and nachos and I probably had a pasta and a salad. Um, and he said, first thing you're gonna do tomorrow morning is go and apologise to, to JL. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, mate, whether you're right or wrong, you're disrespectful, you're a young player in the team, and you spoke to him like that in front of other teammates. He said, the first thing you're gonna do tomorrow is go and, go and say sorry. And I was fuming, I was like, no way, you know. Like, I think, I, I thought I'd finally, you know, got my point and had, Warnie had my back. But that was exactly what he was like. He, he will always have my back in front of people. Um, but if he thinks I'm wrong, he'll be the first person to tell me. I'm a very driven person. I'm very competitive, super competitive, probably to the extent where it's too much com competitiveness. Um, so, and that can be in any form. So playing cricket then was, I ain't gonna lose. I haven't lost to England. I'm not gonna lose to them this year either. And unfortunately we did. So that sort of gave me motivation to say, I'm not gonna retire from cricket until we've got the Ashes back. And uh, watching that 2005 season, being part of it, and then going off to play at Hampshire straight after that, you know, I, 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 I couldn't wait to start playing again. I wanted to play test cricket again. I wanted to get into it. When are we playing England again? How long have we got? Who are we playing in between? Let's smash them. And I was just driven to it. And um, you know, as it turned out, the forgotten series that everyone <laughs> never mentions, <laughs> that 2007 we won 5-0. Um, you know, we played some awesome cricket. There it is. Australia have regained the ashes. And what a surprise, Shane Warne is the man who's done it. Shane Warne's days of walking out at his magnificent home ground as an Australian cricketer are numbered. My time is now. And um, look, I couldn't have asked for things to go any better the script, uh, I suppose, leading up to these last two test matches, I'm going to retire at the end of the Sydney test match. Uh, the reason for doing it that way, I wasn't going to do anything um, be ahead of the team. The team always came first, and once the, the urn was back, then it was going to be time to announce a retirement. I thought about it during 2005. I thought about that series, because I sort of just... Really, it wasn't through performances because the last four or five years of my career, statistically, was probably better with the bat and ball than any other time in my whole career. So I, I was thinking about, can you take a year off? And you can't really take a year off or say, you know what, I need six months to re-energise myself. You can't really do that. You're either in or you're not. And um, so I decided to retire. I thought, if we win the Ashes back, I'm going to retire. I remember thinking about it going to the Perth Test match after we won in Adelaide, 2-0 up. I thought if we win here in Perth, we're going to be 3-0 up because the ash is gone. Maybe that'd be the right time. And uh, I said, let's just see how the game goes. I went and spoke to Ian Chappell uh, in Perth, had a beer with Ian Chappell at the bar at his hotel. And I just said, Chaps, what do you think? And he said, mate, you're the only person that can know if it's the right time or not. Nobody else can tell you. And I said, I, th I think it's time. And he said, all I can say to you is it's better they say to you, why are you, than why don't you? And as soon as he said that, I went, rightio. So the next day we went out, we won the Ashes. And I remember pulling up Punner. I said, hey, Punt, I need a chat. He goes, no. Nope. <laughs> I said, Punt, I need a chat. He said, no. Nope. I said, come here for a sec, mate. Just this. And I sat there and he goes, mate, are you sure, um, you, sure you want to do that? And I said, yeah. We had a couple of them come to me in one game. Um, Two blokes that would have tried to hang on to as long as I could, Warren and McGrath. You'd have liked to hang on to these guys for a little bit longer, but no, very, very personal, short conversation. And, and 
as a captain as well, you're never going to try and talk anybody out of retirement. Um, you know, I've been there and was obviously and retired now as well. And um, you know, once you've made, once you've got had that finality in your own mind, it is you know best that you just get and get and do it. Then Langer rang me and said, I'm going to retire too. Yeah, I said, mate. <laughs> I said, yeah, no problem, buddy. And so we all decided to retire in the same test match, um, which was pretty special. It's as good as it gets. So to finish with Shano, after playing so much of my career with him, or pretty much all of it, was, uh, was incredible. Melbourne and Sydney couldn't have gone any better. For me, that Melbourne day, day one in Melbourne, was probably just about as good as it got. You know, it's my backyard, the MCG, uh, playing England. There ain't no fairy tales, mate, but this is probably as good as it's going to get. And I'm on 699 wickets, so, uh, I mean, how's that work out? Like, seriously, come on. 700 for Shane Wong. What a way to get there. Slightly floated in the air, spinning through the gate from Andrew Strauss. The MCG goes wild. Strauss, he was sweeping and doing a few things and knocking a few on the onside. So I said, punter, let's stop block off that square leg spot. Let's move square leg a bit square. So he's got to play with a straight bat and I'll try and knock him over driving. He's like, okay, let's go with that. It's all right. So we changed the field a bit, slower leg break, and uh, just came out the hand nicely. And he went for a big drive, bowled him, knocked him over 700. Off I went. I, only, I was looking for, as I turned around, I was looking for Pup actually to give him a high five. And I couldn't find Pup. But anyway, I kept running, I couldn't find him. And anyway, everyone jumped up and it was great that the team was so happy. The roar and the noise was just something that I'll always remember. It was something special. Sat back in the chair that night and with a quiet beer and a dart and thinking, that was a pretty good day. It is the final match of the Cricket All-Stars. Warns Warriors against Sachin's Blasters here at the Dodgers Stadium. Now then, what have we got here from Shane Warne, two from two needed. Oh, he swings the bat. Murali can't get there. Warney, Shane Warne finishes it with a six, and he makes it a clean sweep. It must be great to see Shane back out on the field and to be here and to support him. You know what, it's great. I haven't seen a cricket match for a few years, and when we knew we were both going to coincide and be in Los Angeles at the same time, it seemed like an opportunity I couldn't miss. So it's brilliant to be here. Do people that have both gone through the media mill gravitate towards each other? <laughs> um, I was very lucky, as I've said the whole time, and I was. And uh, she's a wonderful lady. Um, you know, we we met at the races, and um, there, the, as soon as we met each other, there was some sort of connection and chemistry there. You know, those two or three years that we had together were fantastic, especially the first few years, they were pretty amazing. Towards the end, it got all a bit, all run by our diary and all sorts of things and all got a bit too complicated and all a bit too hard for both of us. So, you know, the reason we broke up was nothing to do with you know, her doing anything wrong or me doing anything wrong or anything like that. It was just circumstances and continents and kids and work and schedules and it was just all too hard. And we're still good mates now, you know, we're still buddies now, we still speak and chat and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, look, that was a pretty, you know, amazing time because you had the sporting sort of media and then you had the entertainment stuff and all meeting together. And at that same time, I started to get fit because I had my own TV show too. So everyone thought I'd suddenly lost weight, had plastic surgery to my melon and to my head, um, all this sort of stuff. And I'd only done it for Elizabeth, which was just absolutely rubbish and nothing to do with that. I saw myself back on TV and went, holy, God, put on weight again, that's it. Didn't go for the old pill, but um, I, said, <laughs> I said, that's it, I've got to get fit again. And because I'm quite obsessive, I said that once I got into it, I just couldn't, I just saw the results, felt great. And now it's a daily routine, all the health stuff. But those few years was, you know, I, you know we both had a lot of, I suppose, um, well-known friends and uh, all getting together and the circus have managed to who know who and meeting those things and some of the parties we went to and some of the things we shared was fun. But the, the most fun thing was getting to know Elizabeth as a person and, uh, you know, we both loved sitting in front of the fire in our trackies just as much as everything else. And, um, you know, we got along well. We, she got along great with my kids. I got along with her son, Damien. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll be friends for life. Jimmy, 
Jamie Anderson, the in-swinger this time. Had a couple of play misses to Peter Neville. He's gone for the in-swing and has just absolutely smashed into the pegs. England on a roll. Whew. I think to the modern game at the moment, there's been so much absolute garbage spoken about the bats. Let them be as big as they possibly can. That's technology. I'd actually make the stumps a little bit bigger. I'd actually make them a little bit wider. I'd make them a little bit taller. For the bowler, give something back to the bowler. Everyone wants test cricket to survive. And in 10 or 20 years, if we don't do anything, we've got to lose that attitude of, oh, it's tradition. Let's not touch test cricket. Rubbish. Make it four days, make it 96 or 100 overs a day, um, and make it fun. There's also some, you know, what's wrong with stumps and the bales fly off in test cricket? That's cool. That looks really good. Make sure you do that stuff. Make the balls do stuff all the time. And if the, if the ICC said there's $10 million up for grabs, the, the, whatever team can donate to charity, the best team over a two or four year cycle, whatever that, when everyone plays each other, and the winner gets 10 million bucks and can donate it to charity for test cricket, I think that's a win too. Yeah. This is a bit reminds me of the 97 Ashes series, and to tell you a little bit more about it is David Lloyd and the man who got 200 in that test match, Nasser Hussain. Do you think there is room in the modern game for a Shane Warne or will it be knocked out of them by now? <sighs> yeah, I'm not sure is an unfortunate answer. I'm sure that the talent would come through, but it's whether they're going to risk some of the other stuff of the off-field things, whether they're going to be like that. Friday night in Melbourne, it's still 25 degrees. Tiny Club 23. See ya. Let me take you inside. I'm sure there's a lot of younger players that like to have a bit of fun off the field and be a bit naughty off the field. Um, whether that in this sterile environment that we're living in and politically correct all the time, and the do-gooders, they can all get stuffed actually, but there's too many of those do-gooders and politically correct people in the world that are making it less fun. They're the fun police. So whether a lot of those guys would actually get through the system, they have to be very, very talented. And you know, there's just got to be careful in sport these days. We just don't get too much from the outside where the journalists and newspaper and media are too harsh on the players. It's a balance, yes, and in this politically correct day and age, we've just got to be a little bit careful, but sometimes just say get stuff to the fun police. Uh, the only cricket picture I've got hanging up in the whole house is um, a pretty proud moment of mine when I got voted uh, one of the five Wisden Cricketers of the century, and um, I was the only current day player. Uh, the rest were Sir Donald Bradman, um, Sir Garfield Sobers, Sir Jack Hobbs, Sir Vivian, Isaac Vivian Richards, and myself. So they're all sir. I'm not, it's a long way to Australia to get the post, I suppose. I don't have any regrets, so to speak. I don't, because I, you know, I regret doing a few things and I'd like to do things a few bit differently. But there's not one day I stand in and say, I wish I didn't do that because I can't change it. I just can't change what I did 25 years ago. You know, and some people, when they bring up stuff, you know, some of the stuff you spoke about, we've got to remember these are 25 years ago. You know, you know it's a long, long time ago, some of this stuff. 20 years ago. So, you know, I don't have any regrets. I think if I did, if I lived my life thinking, why did I do that? Why didn't I do that? I'd be in a straight jacket now in a padded cell. Um, I'm very, very happy in the place I'm at. I'm very comfortable with the person I am. Um, I don't pretend to be anybody I'm not. I, I have fun. I'm passionate about what I do. I enjoy myself. And I, you know, I'm, I might not have been a good husband for my, for my wife, Simone, but I'm a bloody good father and I love being a dad. He's been a great friend. Um, I, I love his company and I love what he's done for the game. I don't think there's been a cricketer that has had the same impact you know, on the game as Shane Warne has had. Didn't matter if it was the first morning of the test match or day five of the test match, if he gave him the ball, he was going to take wickets for you. He's never pretended to be any different than what he is. He's the genuine article all the time. He's got a million and one things going on in his life, but he loves cricket. When he retired, he left a hole in world cricket, which I don't think will ever be filled. I'd have him right at the top of the tree. I'd have him at number one, um, the greatest cricketer of my era. Shane Warne, I think, is 
arguably the greatest cricketer that's ever played. He's simply magical. I mean, he's, he's right at the top uh, with, with anyone in any era. Enjoy Sky Sports Live on all screens.